These people are showing what they think of modern science. Destroy it! Rip it off! They're trampling crops that have been genetically modified. GM, you know, could be the next disaster. It's a new science, it's only 20 years old, and before we fully know the consequences of this, big business is rushing ahead. Science, or oh, not really good on the science part, but we certainly don't need GM. Scientists can now alter the genetic structure of all sorts of plants and animals, including people. In fact, they can even move one gene from one species into another. Now, should we be worried and angry about this, or should we think of it as a tremendous scientific advance? In this programme, we're not just going to think about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but also about the science and the very origins of genetics. First, we need to go back 150 years to when Charles Darwin was pondering his theory of evolution. Now, Darwin thought that when you have sexual reproduction, the children pick up characteristics from both parents, and it's a bit like blending. You just mix the characteristics from the two parents. So it would be a bit like mixing, say, red and white paint. So you start with white paint, like that, and slop it on, and then you take a bit of red, like this, slop that on top, and you get pink, which is a nice mixture of red and white. But actually, sexual reproduction doesn't work quite like that at all. Look at people, for example. Sometimes children look more like one parent than the other. Sometimes they have features which don't seem to be present in either parent. So what's going on? The person who came up with the answer to this question was not your typical scientist. He was a monk in what's now the Czech Republic, and he worked it all out by studying peas. Tens of thousands of peas. Gregor Mendel didn't set out in life wanting to become a monk, nor indeed to study vegetables. But for a boy from a poor family, joining the church offered the best chance of getting some sort of education. Mendel was fascinated by science. But what kind of science could he study in a rural monastery where there was nothing to look at but plants and animals? That was his answer, plants and animals. He knew nothing about Darwin's work in far off England, but he did know there was one big unanswered question in biology. How do plants and animals pass on their characteristics from one generation to another? The celibate monk was about to focus all his attention on sex. He wanted to study animals, but his bishop objected to his studying animal reproduction. So Mendel looked out at the large monastery garden and decided that this would be his laboratory and his subject would be peas. Starting in 1856, Mendel embarked on what was to become an enormous series of experiments. He took different strains of peas and carefully recorded exactly what happened when they were crossbred. This is a seed catalogue that was produced at the time Mendel was trying to find different types of vegetables for his studies. And, and what do we have in particular here? Well, this plate on peas provides illustrations of three of the characters that Mendel actually worked with in his paper. Flower colour, pod colour, and he also worked with whether the pod is beaded or straight. Mendel used a painstaking method for fertilising his plants, transferring pollen from the male part of one plant to the female part of another. Oh, you're castrating it. Absolutely. So then we go to the other flower, yeah. which, is over which, here. which is a red one. Pull that off. Pull it off. 
Oops. God, it's yep. not very kind, is it, this, oh. this sex business? No, it's rough and ready. Here we go. Right. And this is how Mendel the, did it, is it? Yes, same techniques, really. Right. So this time, we use the style of this one, which has already got pollen on it, yeah. and we use it as a paintbrush. Yeah. Apply it. That's it. Sex in peas. And there we and are. that's it. That's it. Mendel's research was incredibly thorough. Over 10 years, he studied more than 20,000 plants and kept detailed records. He bred generation after generation of peas, and he looked at how the various characteristics cropped up. Eventually, he noticed a consistent and remarkable pattern. What Mendel discovered was really weird. He took an absolutely true breeding red flowered pea. He'd bred it for generations and it was always red. And he took also a true breeding white flowered pea. And then he deliberately crossed these. And what he got was only red peas. It looked as if the, the white had been lost. But he didn't give up there. He let these ones self-fertilise. And in the next generation, well, it began to look as if the white had been lost. But then, up popped the white again. And he bred thousands of them, and he got consistently a three-to-one ratio of red to white. Mendel had discovered a fundamental law of inheritance. When plants breed, each parent passes on a, a factor, a set of instructions for creating every one of the offspring's physical characteristics. Only one of these factors is activated, but the other factor lies dormant and can reappear in later generations. In 1866, his research was published. It should have been heralded as one of the great discoveries of the day. But it wasn't. Very few scientists were aware that somewhere in Eastern Europe, a monk was doing research into one of the greatest mysteries of biology. Very few read the paper where he published it in an obscure little journal. Mendel did send a copy to an eminent professor in Switzerland, but the eminent professor didn't think much of it and wrote back suggesting that Mendel should study even more peas and make sure he'd got his facts right. But not long after this, he became the abbot of his monastery and no longer had time for research. And he died with hardly anyone knowing about his discovery. What's more, after he died, the monks burnt all his notes, not thinking they could be of interest to anyone else. But fortunately, his paper in the little-known scientific journal did survive. In 1900, a biologist stumbled across it in a library and realised Mendel had already found the answer to questions they were still asking more than 30 years later. Today, Mendel's factors are called genes. They determine every characteristic we inherit. Some characteristics are controlled by a single gene, some by several working together. Each cell in your body contains long strands of DNA. Each strand contains hundreds of genes arranged in a set order. Strands are packed up in bundles called chromosomes. Each species has its own unique sequence of genes, and the entire sequence is known as the genome. Now, that DNA sequence, the genome, can be worked out with the help of computers and, and printed out like this. This is part of the genome for the pea. I wanted them to print out the whole lot, but they said if they did that, the paper would fill the room. We wouldn't be able to get in here, let alone breathe. Anyway, once the whole sequence is sorted, the scientists can look at it and identify the genes. There are something like 20,000 genes, even in the pea. And this might be the gene for controlling the colour of the flowers. Well, once they've identified those and isolated them, they can study them and see how they work. And then, in principle, they can modify them. They might be able to make a pea with purple flowers. And that is what genetic modification is all about. <laughs> At this research laboratory, biologists have been developing a new kind of wheat. 
Modern wheat is essentially a designer plant. It all came from original wheat like this, which grew wild something like 10,000 years ago. And then the early farmers began selectively breeding different sorts of grasses to try and make better crops. They had no idea about DNA. They were just using trial and error. We've come so far developing wheat naturally, why do we need to modify it genetically? Well, I'll tell you. I'm an enthusiastic maker of bread. I wish I'd made this loaf because it, it smells wonderful. This was made using about 750 grams of flour. That's about a pound and a half. When you make bread, you mix up the dough, and the important thing is that it must rise. Bubbles of carbon dioxide form, and they have to be trapped by this. This is the gluten which would have been in that pound and a half of flour. This is the sticky stuff in the dough that traps those bubbles of CO2. And the trouble with British flour is that it simply doesn't have enough gluten in it. And here is a plot of genetically modified wheat. It's all covered with netting so the birds can't get in and eat the seeds and spread them. They've put in a gene from Canadian wheat to give it that extra gluten so that the bakers can do their job more easily. Could they have done this by conventional breeding without messing around with the DNA? Well, yes, they could, but it would have taken a whole lot longer. Genetic manipulation is a wonderful shortcut. But gene splicing techniques can appear rather hit or miss. One way to get foreign genes into wheat is to blast them into wheat embryos using a high-pressure gun. Was that it? That fart? That was it. Right. And it's not only wheat they're working on. One of my favourite fruits is the banana. They taste really good, particularly with cereal in the morning, but more than that, they're brilliantly designed. Just look at the wrapper. It's colour-coded. If it's green, it's not ripe. If it's black, it's overripe. If it's yellow, it's going to be delicious. What's more, you can take the wrapper off easily like this, unlike those packets of crisps and things that you need scissors to get into, and then all you have to do is eat it. You don't even have to cut it up. Mmm, perfect. Full of life-giving vitamins and other goodies. So, why on earth would they want to change this humble banana? Are these real banana trees? They are actually not trees, they are actually herbs. Herbs? Herbs. Banana plants are herbs and not trees. And these are modified? Yes, these are modified. We turn off one of the native genes in the plant so that it won't go black in the supermarket or in your bowl at home. And also some genes are antifungal genes taken from onion and radish in order to try and protect the, the banana plants from fungal diseases. From onions? So are they going to taste of onions? No, they're not because they don't have the genes for the taste actually taken from the onions. People say, you know, GM food is dangerous. Could they possibly be poisonous? All of these uh, plants which are modified are all tested continuously all the time in order to make sure that, that they are not toxic um, because that's the last thing we want. And what can be done with plants can also be done with animals. These fish are tilapia, originally from Africa. You won't find them in this country except in very fancy restaurants, but they're extremely popular in Asia, where millions of them are eaten every day. Here at the University of Southampton, they're trying to get them to grow bigger by giving them some genes from salmon. We're trying to improve tilapia as a food fish. So you'll see, I mean, this fish, for example, is the wild type. So this is the size which tilapia would normally be. Whereas the larger fish are also a year old. So here's a large one, here's another two. But there's a huge difference in yes, size. Yes, there's, a, there's a, a differential of about threefold. Right. Uh, and that's the result of the extra growth hormone gene. Do you think it's wrong to interfere with nature like this? I think that we've been meddling with nature for thousands of years. You know, you only have to think of what we've done to sheep, cattle and dogs, as it were, to see that we brought about great changes by selective breeding. And selective breeding means selecting the genes you want. But you do it in a slightly haphazard way, because originally there was no alternative. Uh, now there is an alternative. You can do it one gene at a time with the particular gene you want. But I don't see it as being a significantly different process. 
We've come a long way since Gregor Mendel and his peas. Science seems to have got more complicated. It's all mixed up with difficult questions like, should we be interfering with nature? Some scientists are worried about the risks of genetic manipulation. Would you like to stop all genetic research? No. Genetic research in the laboratory to a scientific aims is a good thing to do as long as it is within a contained environment. It's the releases to the environment that are where you start incurring risks, environmental risks, on crops and on wildlife. Now, research is taking genetic manipulation even further with gene therapy for people. Scientists are hoping to treat inherited conditions by replacing the genes that cause the disease. Thank you. Thank you. Until Emily Thackeray was born, her parents were unaware that they each carried a gene for cystic fibrosis. It was a complete surprise to them when Emily showed signs of the disease. Cystic fibrosis affects the soft tissue of internal organs. Breathing and digestion become difficult and it can lead to early death. I get up about 6.30 in the morning to have my first nebulizer. I then do a session of physiotherapy which involves breathing exercises and to get me cough, to cough to shift the mucus. I then have another nebulizer and take three sets of inhalers. With my breakfast I take about 12 tablets. They're enzymes, and vitamins and antibiotics. Enzymes in total I take about 30 a day. Tablets altogether I take about 45 a day. Cystic fibrosis is just, it's a problem with one little gene, one little code on the whole DNA. And um, my parents are both carriers, which means they have one copy of the gene each. Now, when you've got two carriers, that means if they have children, there's a one in four chance of the child getting both of those genes and having cystic fibrosis. And I was the unlucky one, as it is in my family. But what about Emily's sisters? Lucy is completely unaffected and, and it will never be a, an issue in her life. Abigail is a carrier and that makes her exactly the same as myself. And John, her own personal health is not threatened. Gene therapy is becoming progressively closer to a cure. They've located exactly which gene it is. They're just not sure how to correct it. Research is still going on. No one yet knows how well gene therapy will work, nor how safe it will be. I'm very keen for a cure to go ahead and I think gene therapy is a good idea. But I understand why there's so much controversy surrounding the subject. So what began as a monk studying peas in a garden has turned into a worldwide genetic experiment with benefits and risks. Whether we like it or not, genetic science is going to affect all of us. What do you think about it? Can you get that out of my face, please?